already spread to the entire region. Professor Dominic Levin was born in Singapore a few years after the Indian National Army made history there during the Second World War. He is a friend of mine, a very dear friend. We were longtime colleagues at the London School of Economics where he taught from 1978 to 2011 as professor of Russian government and I was professor of international and comparative politics in the later years of Professor Levin's time at LSE. His reputation as a scholar of empire and as a historian of modern Russia, particularly the 19th and early 20th centuries precedes him. And I don't need to bang on about that. I would prefer to say rather that he knew uh, my mother, Krishna Bose, quite well. Um, they got on very well. Um, Professor Levin has returned to Calcutta and to Netaji Bhavan after 15 years exactly. In January 2009, he came and gave the Shishir Kumar Bose lecture uh, on the evening of 23rd January as well. Um, so he met my mother then, but he has met my mother numerous times uh, in London at my various residences uh, in London over dinner. Indeed, when my mother passed away in February 2020, uh, he was one of the relatively few people I informed of my own accord because I knew he would care and be personally grieved. So he's an excellent candidate to give the Krishna Bose lecture, apart from his own stupendous qualifications and achievements. Um, I would just like to read out to you some of the titles of his numerous books. Um, Empire, The Russian Empire and Its Rivals, published in 2000. Russia against Napoleon. He has a Napoleon fixation. The Battle for Europe, 1807 to 1814, which was published in 2009. He has one of the most amazing collections of toy soldiers, by the way. Uh, it's, a, it's like a museum that could rival the Netaji Museum uh, to some extent. Uh, and uh, I have uh, seen that collection many times. Towards the Flame, Empire, War, and the End of Tsarist Russia, The Revolution, published in 2015, and most recently, In the Shadow of the Gods, The Emperor in World History, a fascinating book uh, which has a Mughal miniature of the Emperor Akbar on its cover. So that that's just a sample of his scholarly writing. When Dr. Shishir Bose set up the Netaji Research Bureau here more than six decades, almost seven decades ago, he could have set it up just as an institute of history, right? Uh, but it was incorporated formally, I think, in 1961 as an Institute of History, Politics, and International Affairs. And while our core work remains putting the focus relentlessly on the Indian freedom struggle, and particularly on Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, Sharat Chandra Bose, and the noble ideals and values they represented and personified, 
Um, Nitaji Research Bureau has always been concerned with contemporary problems. So we have hosted, even in 2022, <coughs> and prior to that in the late 1990s, mid-1990s, early 2000s, important conferences on the Kashmir conflict right here with participants from Jammu and Kashmir. Today, I was privileged to give uh, the annual Netaji lecture this afternoon uh, at One Woodburn Park, um, our former family home, uh, which is now Shorut Bose Bhavan. It's Shorut Bose's uh, former house. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the home of the Netaji Institute for Asian Studies. They have an annual Netaji lecture, and this year they invited me to do it. So I spoke on <clears throat> understanding October 7th, 2023, and its aftermath, a long view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. <coughs> and today, we have one of the world's foremost authorities on Russia and on empire to enlighten us about the other major war that is about to complete two years next month. So may I now invite Professor Dominic Levin, my dear friend, a friend of Nitaji Research Bureau, a friend of my mother's, a friend of my brother's, to deliver the fourth Krishna Bose lecture, following on from Gayatri Spivak, uh, Nirupama Rao Menon, and Ronin Sen on Russia and Ukraine past, present, and future. Please join me in welcoming Professor Levin. Thank you very much, Amantra. Uh, and thank both the Bose brothers, both now old friends, for inviting me. And thank you for coming. You know, I think I became a historian as much as anything because when I was very small, a whole range of older relatives, most of them female, my grandmother, my great aunts, completely captured my imagination by tales of the worlds from which they came. That meant Imperial Russia and the Baltic provinces before the revolution. It meant Berlin before 1914, the old Austrian Empire. It meant the British Indian Empire. Both my mother and my grandmother were, after all, born in India. The thing about these elderly female relatives was that they had wonderful memories and were great storytellers. They were also very intelligent. They were full of wit and irony. They were very kind and sensitive, particularly to younger people, but they were also tough, above all, to themselves, and they were people of principle. And they were absolutely fantastic, and without them, my life would have been much poorer. And when I first met Krishna, I immediately recognized in her someone very like my old female relations. And I like to think we became very good friends. And certainly this lecture is dedicated to her with a deep bow and a great sense of regret at her passing, but enormous gratitude uh, that I was able to meet her, talk to her so often, and count her among my friends. Now, what I am going to talk about is, of course, Ukraine, but also Russia and empire. I am not basically an expert on Ukraine. I'm not a historian of Ukraine. I'm not really an expert on contemporary affairs. So you will find more history, more empire, more Russia uh, than you will a discussion of what might happen next year. I'll start with empire. Now, of course, by empire, I do mean a political system which operates without the consent of the governed. That 
for a historian, frankly, does not distinguish empire from most other polities in the pre-modern era, in other words, for most of history. There are very few polities in history before even the 20th century, uh, let alone before the 19th, which were based on the explicit consent of the governed. But above all, what I mean by empire are three things. Firstly, enormous scale. It is the enormous size of empire which provides the resources for imperial power. But at the same time, the enormous size of empire is a great obstacle to good governance. And I think secondly of empire as multi-multi-ethnicity. Managing variety has always been one of the great difficulties, though sometimes one of the strengths of empire. And if I was going to generalize, I would say that in the modern era, technology made size a bit less of a problem, still a big problem, but less than in the past with pre-modern communications. On the other hand, the politicization of ethnicity, in other words, the idea of nationalism and of popular sovereignty made managing multi-ethnicity a much bigger problem for empire than it had been in the past. But above all, what I mean by empire is power. Unless a polity, a country, has dominated the international relations of a large region of the world for a significant time, I personally don't think it's worth calling it an empire. Now, empire means hard power, military power, diplomatic power, financial and economic power. But it also, of course, hugely means soft power. The power of ideology, of culture, etc. Just one little example. Two of the greatest empires in history are the Mongol Empire, before the British, the greatest empire in territorial extent they'd ever been, and the empire of the caliphate, the early caliphate, the Umayyads and the Abbasids. Both of them, in terms of hard power, rest on the military power of nomads, who for about 1,500, 2,000 years before 1,500 common era, our era, were, in us were usually in military terms superior to the sedentary societies they conquered. Of the two empires I've mentioned, undoubtedly in terms of raw military power, uh, the Mongols were much superior. After all, they were drawing their resources from the, the greatest homeland of the steppe warrior nomad. In other words, northern Eurasia. The steppe which stretches all the way from Hungary to Mongolia. And yet, undoubtedly, it is the empire of the caliphates uh, which is more important in history because in terms of soft power, it incorporated, embodied, and pushed Islam, a great new universal religion uh, which made an enormous impact on world history and still does. So this is an example of how soft power in the long run is usually more significant. We currently live in what is probably the last few years of what you might describe as Anglo Empire, meaning initially the empire of the British, then the global predominance of the British and Americans in union, or an alliance anyway, and since the Second World War, above all, the predominance in the world of the United States, though with the countries of the former British Empire, the Anglophone countries of the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, still actually as the United States' greatest allies. The soft power, the ideology of these empires, fundamentally liberal capitalism, liberal democracy. I think you can talk about the predominance in the world of Anglo Empire since the Seven Years' War, in other words, since the mid-18th century. It was the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 63, that established that North America would be English, not French, and went a long way also to making the foundations of 
European empire in South Asia, British, not French. And I think you can see the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, the Two World Wars, and the Cold War as basically attempts to overthrow Anglo-predominance in the world, if you like, the Anglo Empire. All of those attempts failed. We are now facing uh, what is a new challenge, which fundamentally is China in alliance to some extent with Putin's Russia and Iran. And it would surprise me if we are not seeing the beginning of the end of Anglo-predominance in the world. That predominance initially in the mid-18th century was based on British and above all English maritime, financial and commercial power. It was enormously enhanced by the fact that at the beginning of the 19th century, Britain became the homeland, the first homeland of the Industrial Revolution. That strengthened the Anglo empire, the Anglo predominance in the world. There was nothing specifically unique to Britain, however, which stopped the Industrial Revolution from spreading, which it did during the 19th century across Europe, and in the case of the United States and Japan, beyond Europe. Within Europe, it went first to Central Europe, and by the 1870s, Germany is the leading economic power in Europe, the spearhead of the so-called Second Industrial Revolution, and is potentially, therefore, continental Europe's hegemon. By the first years of the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution is spreading fast into Eastern Europe, above all into the Russian Empire. And the Russian Empire is growing, in economic terms, faster than any other European country. The First World War starts above all else. Because the Germans are top dogs now, they reckon within a generation they will have lost that position to Russia, so they decide to exploit what you might describe as a window of opportunity. Rather interestingly, in that period between 1905 and 1914, though of course the Russians are obsessed with German power, the German threat, they are also beginning to worry very hard about China as a future threat to Russian domination of North Asia and indeed to Russian security in Asia as a whole. One of the most intelligent, also one of the nastiest, Russian right-wing public intellectuals, a man called Menshikov, Mikhail Menshikov, tried to calm the fears of his fellow Russians by telling them that it would take almost certainly at least three generations for China to recover from its present weakness and to pose a real challenge to Russia. And that by that time, India would long since have thrown off the British yoke and would be not just a great power, but Russia's natural ally against Chinese domination of Asia. Now, the details have changed. But actually, what I think remains true in Menshikov's insight is the enormous potential power and the importance of India in the present and future global setup. In the great confrontation between the United States and China, which is coming over the horizon and which might, God forbid, very easily end up in a war which will make anything that happens in Ukraine or in look very small. India is in the key pivot position uh, and could play a role of enormous importance, possibly in the avoidance of that conflict. India also seems to be best place to lead what it's now fashionable to call the global south in the enormous crisis which is going to overcome us all, which is called climate change. So Menshikov may have got perhaps, perhaps, some of the details wrong in terms of India as Russia's natural ally against Chinese hegemony in Asia, but he certainly understood the importance of this country. So I said that empire and Russia were my two basic specialities, what I would talk most about. Now, 
you know, you may have heard my definition and scratched your heads a bit. This probably isn't what you're used to as a definition of empire. I think a person who starts his journey into the study of empire from a Russian perspective is going to come up with rather def different definitions of empire uh, than you would if you started from the British Empire or indeed any of the European overseas maritime empires. I mean, one of the very interesting aspects of Russia is that it is simultaneously in the tradition of the great Eurasian land empires, in some ways much more like the Mughals than it is like British India. And yet it is also very much part of the expansion of Europe uh, and you know, what pushed Russia were both the sinews of power developed by Europe, the European army, etc., but also much of the ideology of European civilizing mission. So Russia is a rather interesting hybrid when it comes to empire. I first began thinking systematically about Russia and empire in the last years of the Soviet Union. Now, if imperial Russia is a rather strange kind of empire, the Soviet Union is an even stranger one. Indeed, there is a great deal of argument as to whether it was or wasn't an empire. To my mind, that is a silly question. Whether you define the Soviet Union as an empire or not largely, define, uh, largely depends on your definition. And your definition usually depends on your ideological position and or what it is that you're trying to investigate as regards Soviet, the Soviet Union and Soviet history. It seems to me the interesting question, certainly for an academic to ask, is not whether the Soviet Union was or was not an empire. It is whether thinking of the Soviet Union in comparative imperial perspective tells you interesting things, gives you unusual insights. And to my mind, on the whole, it does. And I would say never more so than when you are thinking about the end of empire and the consequences of empire's collapse. And that brings us directly on to the current Ukrainian crisis. The basic point about the end of empire is that it almost always results in catastrophic conflict. Empires are, by definition, very great powers. The collapse of very great powers causes enormous ructions in the international system. It causes power vacuums, it causes all the uncertainties, resentments, etc., that the rise and fall, and ambitions that the rise and fall of great powers gives rise to. That means international war. If one thinks, for instance, and I'll come back to this, you know, the collapse of the Romanov Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that is absolutely connected to the First World War. And since the Second World War was really the First World War Part Two, it is directly connected to the great struggles which traumatized the world in the 20th century. But it isn't just that the collapse of empire gives rise to international struggles uh, because of its impact on the balance of power in international relations. The second reason why empire's fall results in conflict is because empires, by definition, are multi-multi-ethnic communities, and when you attempt to divide up communities which have lived intermingled, often for centuries, and you try and create between them hard borders, that is virtually bound to cause conflict. Apart from anything else, you know, which side of the border are you going to be? Often the nation-state borders, which are drawn up after the end of empire, cut through communities. They virtually always result in minorities being in the new nation-states. It's also the case that as long as you have an empire, certainly of the traditional European land sort, in the end, Nationality, defining who the people is and who the people is not, is not that significant. The people are not sovereign. The emperor is sovereign. The emperor is equally sovereign and lord over peoples of all description. 
It's only when you begin moving from empire to the nation that you have to begin defining what is the nation, who is the nation. And since that definition usually entails ethnicity, language, culture, history, it also usually results in very dire conflicts as regards who precisely are the people, are the nation, etc. The third point to note about the end of empire is that the conflicts it unleashes very often take a generation or more to unfold. You know, if you think of this part of the world, uh, there can have been fewer more illogical and unstable uh, post-imperial polities than Pakistan. In other words, the attempt to merge into one country, uh, East Pakistan, East Bengal, and you know, parts of the Punjab and the, the present uh, territories of Pakistan. It was a nonsense. It was nevertheless a nonsense which survived for a long generation until civil war, revolution, and as a result, international war, ended the existence of East Pakistan as part of a single Pakistani state. In Sri Lanka, for a generation after independence, fundamentally, the old elites continued to rule. It took a generation before you had Sinhalese ethno-nationalism with a very powerful ethno-linguistic, cultural, historical identity coming to the fore and in the end pushing Sri Lanka into civil war. The most famous example, of course, is Germany. It takes a generation before the consequences of the collapse of Germany and Austria-Hungary come home to root. And those consequences are Hitler and the Second World War. Now, in talking about the German case, and making comparisons with Russia, I am not actually comparing Putin to Hitler or even Mussolini. Um, unfortunately, there are elements of fascism now you know, very evident in Putin's Russia, but Putin himself is not Hitler and is not Mussolini. Uh, for all their evil, and they were both evil men, Mussolini in particular was in some ways a great man. He was a formidable personality, a man who'd risen to the top as a demagogue, but also as a sort of thinker, uh, a man who w was genuinely of intellectual interest and a very considerable, charismatic personality. Putin's not like that. He's really a better-than-average, upper-middle-level bureaucrat who chance as much as anything else uh, pushed into the position of president of Russia. The basic point I'm trying to make, therefore, is not a comparison between Putin and Hitler or indeed between uh, contemporary Russia and Nazi Germany. The basic point is that even without Hitler, the German elites would probably have challenged the Versailles settlement in the East. The basic point was a simple one. You know, Germany in 1919, like Russia in 1991, was the defeated power, the loser. But it was also, as Russia was, potentially, latently, the most powerful state in the region. Once it recovers its power, there is always a very high chance that a state, a people, a nation, if you want to call it in that position, is going to challenge the post-imperial status quo. And that leads me on to my fourth point, which is that land empire's disintegration is usually even more dangerous, even more destabilizing than the disintegration of the European overseas empires. And that is for a number of reasons, the most basic of which is that if the former metropole uh, you know, is, is div divided from its former colonies by oceans, it is not usually directly involved in the post-imperial crisis. There's been a civil war in Myanmar ever since the British left. The British barely meant, notice it. Uh, Myanmar is a long way from Kent. Uh, a land empire is a different matter. 
uh, all the resentments, the sense of humiliation of the former metropolitan power are still directly involved in territorial disputes. So, of course, is the dispute over borders. The one post-imperial struggle which the British could not run away from is Ireland. If you look at the collapse of the Russian Empire in the context of the collapse of the other European empires in the 20th century, one basic geopolitical point is extremely important. Once they lost their overseas empires, Britain, France, the Netherlands essentially became relatively insignificant players on the world stage. At best, they were third-class powers, despite the fiction of British and French membership, permanent membership of the UN Security Council. Russia is somewhat different. Russia held on to the jewel of its imperial crown after the collapse of the Romanov Empire and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That means the vast Russia in Asia, which we sometimes as a shorthand called Siberia, where most of Russian oil and gas, for instance, most of Russian minerals, most of Russian gold, jewel, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to be held. It's as if the British, after the end of empire, were still attached directly to Canada and possibly Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. At that point, Britain would no longer be a superpower, but it would still be a great power, as Russia is. And I think, in one way, and I know this may sound a bit theoretical, but it is, I think, at the heart of the issue. The basic point is that the West very much underestimated Russia's latent power, but Putin even more dramatically overestimated it. And it is the underestimate of the West and its failure to take Russian sensibilities fully into account plus even more Putin's radical overestimation of Russian power, which is at the heart of the Ukrainian war. If you go back to the 1890s, the chief legal advisor to the Russian Imperial Foreign Minister, Ministry was a man called Professor Theodore Martins. In the 1890s, he wrote what was the great Russian textbook on international law. And in that book, among other things, it's a rather long book, uh, he said that if the increasingly dominant theory as regards the legitimacy of states took root, in other words, the principle of popular sovereignty, the principle that to every people defined by history, language, and culture, there should be an independent state, the national democratic principle, in shorthand, if that principle triumphed in the vast area currently ruled over by the Romanovs, the Hohenzollerns, the Habsburgs, and the Ottomans, the world of empire, in other words, the result would be mayhem. And he was right. It has taken two world wars, genocide in the absolute fullest meaning of the word, the Jews and Armenians, vast-scale ethnic cleansing, the German communities of Eastern Europe, to turn what used to be the map of empire in East Central Europe into what we have now, which is, roughly speaking, the map of nations. And the game isn't entirely over. One empire fell but then resurrected itself in socialist form, the USSR. And the collapse of the Soviet Union means that we are now back to the post-imperial chaos in Europe, in Eastern Europe. Meanwhile, I think you could argue that the chaos which engulfs much of the Middle East is still, to some extent, a post-imperial or even post-Ottoman chaos. For various reasons, the European model of the mono-ethnic state defined by language, history, uh, etc., does not fit, and of course by citizenship, does not fit very well into that wider Middle Eastern world where loyalties traditionally went to Islam, to region, or to dynasty. 
and that is still a source of very great instability, quite apart from something I'll mention in a minute, which is, of course, the aftermath of the French and British empires in that part of the world. And then we have to remember as well that most of Asia, most of the great states of Asia, India, Indonesia, Iran, even China, these are not empires, but they are the heirs of empire, and in many ways they are much more like traditional empires in their scale and multi-ethnicity than they are like the European model of the ethno-national state. I think if we face continental Asia catching what I think of as the European nationalist disease, Gujarat for the Gujaratis, Xinjiang for the Uyghurs, As Aceh for the Achenese, Baluchistan for the Baluchis, there is going to be such chaos uh, that the world may well not survive it, given the other problems we face. One way to put the present Russo-Ukrainian crisis, post-imperial crisis in perspective, is to think of the British Empire. At least from the British perspective, the end of empire was managed not too badly. In other words, the British did not expose themselves in the same way as the Dutch and the French to military defeat and humiliation. They got out of empire, often dumping, of course, the post-imperial problems on the people they left behind. But they got out on the whole themselves relatively unscathed. I stress the word relatively. I hardly need to say that here. Look, if you think of the world's problems all the way from Ireland to Fiji, an awful lot of them are post-British imperial problems. The same is true of Cyprus. The same is true of Iraq. The same is obviously true of Palestine. And here in the Indian subcontinent, the battle over Kashmir, which has resulted in a number of wars and now confrontation at a nuclear level, uh, is still with us 75 years after the end of the British Empire in India. And potentially, given the enormous pressures that climate change is going to put on the governments of both India and Pakistan, it could end with catastrophic uh, consequences. And I fear, to take up the theme of Shumantra earlier today, that actually the likeliest scenario for the Russo-Ukrainian crisis is a conflict which will last for 50 years, possibly a century. It will not be continual war any more than the Kashmir dispute. And the Indo-Pakistani confrontation has been perpetual war. It will freeze and it will unfreeze. But there will be no true peace, and there will always be the dangers of confrontation up to catastrophic uh, levels which actually put the survival of the planet at risk. I am, as you will have noticed, an optimist. When giving this kind of talk to British, and particularly English, audiences, I try to make comparisons with the collapse of the Soviet Union and British experience. To get a sense of what the Russians went through, in British terms, you would have to imagine that the British Empire collapsed more or less overnight in the 1930s when most English people saw it both almost as a fact of nature, something which was around like your grandmother more or less, and on the whole as benevolent. You would have to combine the overnight collapse of the British Empire with the secession of Scotland and Wales, which roughly speaking is Ukraine and Belarus. You would have to combine it with an economic depression much worse than the 1930s. You know, the impact of collapse in the 1990s in the Soviet Union was a decline in Russian male life expectancy equivalent to a re you know, relatively significant war. You would have to think of it as well as the fall of the constitutional monarchy and of the parliamentary system which is, roughly speaking, the collapse of the Soviet state and of the Communist Party. And you would have to think of it really as worse than the 1930s in the sense that 
you were dealing with the collapse of an entire society's value system, which was Soviet socialism, and the coming to power of completely different principles, global capitalism, in a particularly fierce and uncontrolled and ruthless manner. So, you know, even the rather phlegmatic tea-drinking English of the 1930s, faced with all of that, would have got a little bit, of ex a little bit excited. But actually, it's worse than that, and particularly when you try and make the comparison between Scotland and Ukraine. The basic point is that no Englishman thinks that the origins of English religion and the English state, the English monarchy, uh, lie in Scotland for the very obvious reason that they don't. But the origins of the Russian state, the Russian monarchy, and above all of Russian religion do lie in territory which is now Ukraine. And above all, and most important and most devastating, no Englishman has ever denied that the Scots were a separate people. But most Russians, certainly until recently, didn't think of the Ukrainians certainly as a completely separate people. That is partly because of the many connections into marriage, etc., etc., migration, you name it. Uh, that have united Russians and Ukrainians in the last 150 years. It is also because the official ideology of the Tsarist state and of the, the empire of the Romanovs did not think of Ukraine or Belarus as colonies, as imperial parts of the empire as such. Uh, the official ideology talked about the regathering of the Russian lands, claiming that Kiev was the first of all Russian cities, and that therefore the process by which Ukraine and Belarus were brought under the scepter of the Romanovs in the 17th and 18th centuries is not imperial conquest. It is, on the contrary, the regathering and the reunification of the Russian nation whose origins go right back you know, to the 10th century. And that essentially is the line that Vladimir Putin is pushing and probably actually believed uh, when he launched this war. You know, his famous essay, if you like, uh, about how the Russians and Ukrainians were essentially one people. Is this in any way plausible? Well, the first thing one has to note when trying to answer that question is that modern nations were not created by God. They evolved over history. Sometimes they took a very long time to evolve, and they didn't evolve in one teleological inevitable process which led from Adam and Eve to the existence of today's nations. Think back to 1850. I spent half my life thinking back to 1850 when I'm not imagining that I'm defeating Napoleon 50 years before. But think back to 1850. At that time, there was an independent Bavarian state, which had existed for a long time, and to some extent, Bavarian nation. There were very few people in 1850 who thought that Scotland could ever be an independent sovereign state again. And most Europeans had never even heard of Ukraine. And now we are 2020. Ukraine is an independent country. Scotland may well become an independent one. The idea of Bavarian independence is inconceivable. So things do change. I hardly need to tell you that the English are a nation. God bless them. A stubborn uh, nation with all the arrogance and the illusions that nations sometimes have, particularly imperial nations. But of course they didn't start off as a single people. Uh, at its most basic, the, the, the present English people are a combination of Romano-Britons pushed westwards in, you know, in what's today England. Scandinavians, Vikings in the Dane law of eastern England and the Anglo-Saxons in between. And they've basically become English having spent by now over a thousand years as subjects of the same king and of the same state, in what is a relatively small space, the English Isle, island, uh, 
which for many centuries by now has been tightly integrated both in terms of communications, economic links, etc., etc. Nobody would doubt that the English are a nation. The Russians and Ukrainians, well, they are both East Slavs, which doesn't mean that much. The Great Treaty of 1654, which brought central Ukraine under the Romanovs, the Russian and Ukrainian negotiators had to have translators and interpreters. They didn't speak the same language. They are Orthodox Christians for the most part, and that is important. But actually, most Ukrainians, or well, no Ukrainians, lived under Russian rule before the 1650s, and a quarter of Ukrainians didn't live under Russian rule until 19, well, if you call the Soviet Union Russian rule, until 1945. And of course, this is a far greater area than England, and it was far less developed economically and in terms of communications. I think if you were going to try to ask whether there was any merit to Putin's idea that the Russians and Ukrainians were one people, you might concede that in 1850, look, here I am, back again in 1850, most educated Ukrainians, which didn't mean much more in those days than the landowning class, did think of themselves in political terms as Russians. Didn't mean that many of them didn't have a sense of local folklore, regional identity. But for God's sake, in England, Landowners in Yorkshire and other educated Yorkshire people had a sense of very strong regional, local identity without ever doubting that they were English as well and above all English in political terms. But the point about 1850 in Ukraine and in the Russian Empire is that one is in a pre-modern era. One is an era, era before mass literacy, urbanisation, and modern conceptions of the nation. And I can give you all sorts of examples of that. At one end of Ukraine, you have Odessa, the southwest. Odessa in 1850, Odessa in 1914, even Odessa in 1991 is not a Ukrainian city, but nor is it in the narrow sense, ethno-national sense, a Russian city. In 1914 and in 1850 even more, it is a great imperial city, packed with Jews, Armenians, Italians, Greeks, everything under the sun. When Mark Twain, the American author, visited uh, Odessa in the mid-19th century, he said, this place is just like Chicago. And he's right, it was. At the other end of Ukraine, you have an area which is now absolutely the seat of conflict, the Donbass, the great mining area. And there I have a sort of personal element. You know, in 1850, the city and the mines, which are now called Donetsk, were owned by my great-grandfather. Was my great-grandfather a Russian or a Ukrainian? Well, of course he wasn't a Ukrainian. Uh, he was not an ethnic Russian. He was a Protestant, Baltic German but he was in no sense German in political sense. You know, he was an aristocratic uh, landowner who spoke seven languages. Uh, if you'd asked him, he, was, he would have said he was a Russian, by which he meant he was a loyal subject of the Russian emperor. He was the Lord Chamberlain of the Imperial Court. He was the biggest landowner in what's now Latvia, quite apart from owning the core of the Ukrainian coal mining industry. I mean, you're in a different world. And the point is here that it's not just him, it's not just the top elite. You know, he didn't, of course, develop the coal mines, he let them out to a Welshman called John Hughes, which is why what's now Donetsk used to be called Hughesovka. The core skilled miners were Welshmen. They weren't Russian and they weren't Ukrainian. Sure, in time, the miners, you know, most of the miners are Russian immigrants. But most of the population of Ukraine are peasants. And at the other end of the spectrum to my great-grandfather, they too are completely devoid of modern national identity. They're peasants. They have a very limited world. It doesn't go much beyond their village and maybe the little local market town. To the extent that they have a broader identity, 
than the village and the very little local region. It's religious. They are Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox for the most part. And to the extent that they are Russian Orthodox, they are to some extent monarchist because the Tsar is seen as the protector of the Orthodox community and there is constant propaganda through the churches that this is his role. And also the emperor, as is by no means unique to Russia or Ukraine, is often venerated as some kind of in-the-sky symbol of justice in a deeply unjust and exploitative world. So, you know, if you go fishing round in the pre-modern era for modern ideas of national identity and national belonging, particularly in these Eurasian dynastic empires, you end up with nonsense. You pervert the past in order to you know, serve contemporary political and ideological purposes, which is exactly Putin's interpretation of Russian history. By 1914, uh, you're beginning to talk. Now there is a huge argument going on in Ukraine among the educated classes as to whether the Ukrainians are a branch of the Russian people or, on the contrary, whether they are a separate people and a nation in embryo. The situation is hugely confused by the fact that although three quarters of people we would now describe as Ukrainians are subjects of the Russian emperor, the other quarter are subjects of the Austrian emperor, of the Habsburgs. And it is in Austrian Galicia that a sense of Ukrainian national identity and separateness is most developed. Above all, because the Austrian empire is a more liberal, tolerant state and allows, even sometimes encourages, the various peoples to develop their own sense of national identity. It remains still the case, though, that the biggest group of Ukrainians, in other words, the peasant Ukrainians in the Russian Empire, do not yet have a strong sense of national identity. They remain what they were in 1850, men and women with very local horizons, whose broader horizons tend to be religious and even still sometimes monarchist. This is a hugely important issue whether the Ukrainians are a separate people or whether they are a branch of the broader Russian people. Partly because if Ukrainians are Russians, then certainly Belarusians are Russians too. In that case, Russians are more than two-thirds of the population of the empire. But if the Ukrainians are not Russians, they are a separate people, that implies the Belarusians are as well, and that means that Russians are only 43% of the empire's population. And in an era when nationalism and the nation and popular sovereignty are mounting an ever greater challenge to empire, that is hugely important from the perspective of Russia's rulers. It is also the case that in 1914, what we now call Ukraine is the center of the Russian empire's grain industry, grain exports, of its coal, metallurgical, and iron industries. Take away Ukraine in 1914, and Russia ceases to be a great power. If Russia ceases to be a great power, Germany dominates Central and Eastern Europe, and therefore is the predominant power in Europe as a whole. The First World War, as much as anything else, turns around the fate of Ukraine. If the Germans had not brought the Americans into the war, just as the Russian Revolution was leading to the disintegration of the Russian Empire and Russian power, the Germans would have won the First World War. In 1918, they signed a peace treaty with Russia, which inter alia meant that Ukraine was accepted by the Russians as an independent state, de jure, but in practice a German protectorate. And if the Germans had been able to sustain the peace treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which they probably would have been able to do had the Americans not by then joined the war, Germany would have won. And maybe that would have been better for the human race. Handing over East Central Europe to the tender mercies of the Kaiser's Germany uh, is no one's idea of a just or perfect solution to the war. 
but perhaps it was better than a Second World War, Hitler, Stalin and the Holocaust. And the Second World War, as I've said, was really the First World War Part One, uh, Part Two. I can't go on to, into this in any detail, but the enormous importance in the past of Ukraine to Russian power lingers in the memory and in the mentality of Russia's rulers, Putin included. By 1991, Ukraine is not as important as it was in 1914, partly because Europe is no longer the center of the world, but it is still very important, not least to Russia. It was the determination of the Ukrainians to secede from the Soviet Union, which doomed Gorbachev's project of holding the Union together and modernizing it, and doomed any chance of any variant of post-Soviet Russian empire. And that also sticks in the gullet of Putin and his friends. By 1991, it is clear that a sense of Ukrainian identity has spread to the mass of the population to a far greater degree than it had in 1914. It's nonsense by 1991 to claim there is no Ukrainian nation. Nevertheless, it's not complete nonsense, and the situation is complicated. This binary, Russian or Ukrainian, which we're using now, is less clear in 1991, quite apart from the fact that there is a huge amount of intermarriage. Very, very many people are of mixed Russian and Ukrainian origin. There is also the fact that confusing this issue of Russian or Ukrainian identity is the fact that there was also something called a Soviet identity. Loyalty by then less to the ideology of Marxism-Leninism, but to the experience of having lived in Soviet society, under the Soviet state, uh, and identifying with many aspects of that society and culture. And then there is yet another issue, regional identity. Look, we've talked about the Donbass. In many ways, the dominant identity in the Donbass was a regional one, not least because you're dealing with mining communities. Begin to try and say, are you Russian or Ukrainian, can be to make really false distinctions for many citizens of what became Ukraine. What is absolutely certain, though, is that if it was already nonsense to deny the existence of a separate Ukrainian nation in 1991, it was madness by 2021. Uh, Putin's claim that this is one nation is spurious, and he should have understood that. And there, I think, you are beginning to talk about an isolated autocrat um, who you know, has been in power for a long time and, as is the way with autocrats, is usually told what he wants to hear. It is also the case that whereas under the monarchy and under the Soviet Union, Khrushchev and Brezhnev, after all, both came from what is now Ukraine. But once Ukraine breaks away, the Russian leadership becomes ever more narrowly Russian. There is really only one Ukrainian who knows about Ukraine in the top echelon of Putin's Russia, uh, and that is Dmitry Kozak. And it is he, according to my brother anyway, uh, that Putin deputizes to try to form what you might describe as a Ukrainian fifth column which will take over the government of Ukraine once Putin's plan succeeds and Ukraine becomes again under Moscow's control. And apparently Kozak went out, did a lot of groundwork, tried to build up what would be uh, a governing cadre for Putin's conquered Ukraine and came back to Putin and said, it just can't be done, boss. By now, it's too late. There aren't the people there who are willing to support our takeover of Ukraine. And Putin played no attention. So, you know, that tells one a good deal. It brings us on to the question of who is responsible for this mess. Well, I mean, as you will have gathered from what I've said, I think Vladimir Putin does bear much the greatest responsibility and his, you know, whatever. Partly because his interpretation of what was going on in Ukraine post-independence 
is simply false. It's a question of false intelligence fed to an autocrat who is not willing to believe the truth in the last resort because it's not what he wants to hear. And it did matter enormously. I mean, you know, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, he put in a relatively small group of elite troops basically to take the airport at Kiev to capture Zelensky and to mount a kind of mini-coup. And after them, he sent in what essentially is the riot police, the National Guard. Not at all surprisingly, when these people found that they were not beating up unarmed you know, demonstrators on the streets of Moscow, but fighting a war, they didn't do very well. And that fundamentally false operational plan, uh, which wrecked the Russian invasion of Ukraine initially, is directly rooted in Putin's conception that, you know, the Russians are going to be greeted with flowers if you can just knock out Zelensky and his crew. And then on top of that, and more broadly, I think you could certainly blame Putin, partly because, you know, in a way typical of secret policemen, everything is conspiracy. Uh, you know, for him, the fact that Ukraine is developing a separate identity must be a CIA plot. The idea that things can come below, from below, that society can develop ideas of its own identity without Western agents doesn't really impinge much on a KGB officer. And beyond that, you could also say that in terms of soft power, Putin blew things. You know, Putin's Russia is not a very attractive model for most young, educated, go-ahead Ukrainians. So, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that Putin was the only person responsible seems to me absolutely clear that, in the first place, the West underestimated Russian power and determination. They also trod on Russian toes in ways which were not necessary. Now, I think you can argue over the expansion of NATO both ways. You can well understand why the Russians felt cheated. This was not what they'd been promised in you know, the years immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was not what they were told when they got out of Germany, etc. On the other hand, you, know, you can also understand the point of view, let us say, of a Latvian. You know, you're a very small people. You've suffered appallingly under variants of Russian Empire, of course, in the 20th century, under Stalin. Uh, you know something about Russian history. You also maybe know something about what happens when empires collapse. Can you really be blamed for wanting NATO's protection, American protection, when it's on offer? No, you can't. So I wouldn't blame the West simply sort of outright for this whole business of NATO until you get to the issue of Ukraine. You know, for any Russian ruler, the idea that an independent Ukraine, which would include Crimea, Sevastopol, the Russian naval base there, all the memories that Crimea means uh, for Russian identity, plus the fact that you know, if you lose Crimea, Russia ceases to be the predominant power in the Black Sea. No Russian government is going to sit down and watch that happen. Uh, you know, it is going to uh, object and, if necessary, fight. And certainly nothing was stupider than waving the idea of NATO membership in front of Ukrainian noses publicly, while in fact knowing damn well that NATO had no intention of incorporating Ukraine. Uh, you know, this is extremely foolish. Having said all of that, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a pessimist. I don't say that this war was inevitable, but there was always a very good chance it would happen. I am less surprised by what is happening now than I was by the fact that the Soviet Union, this vast empire with a very cruel political tradition, massive forces, security forces, not just collapsed almost overnight, but collapsed with barely a shot fired in its, def its defense. You know, if I was on Margaret Thatcher's little foreign policy advisory committee for all sorts of accidental reasons. I was of no importance, but it was a very interesting perch from which to watch the end of the Cold War. So was another government committee I was on, but I won't talk about that now. Um, when I got on that committee in 1984, if I'd said that within seven years the Soviet Union would be gone, I would have been seen even by Margaret Thatcher's little group of advisors as an extreme right-wing Cold War hawk. 
If I had said that it would collapse within seven years with no shot fired in its defence by the KGB, the army, the lot, you'd have been laughed at. And that is actually what happened, and it was astonishing. And it was also, above all, astonishing when you compare it with the collapse of other great empires, which, as I've already said, usually results in catastrophic war. It does seem to me, therefore, that what we're seeing now is not very surprising. It also seems to me, and always did seem to me, that the Ukraine, which emerged as an independent state within the borders of 1991, was always going to be in deep trouble if the relationship between Russia and the West declined and collapsed into enmity. If Ukrainians were made to choose between East and West, even in purely economic terms, trade treaties, membership of the EU, or prior, you know, preferential trading with Russia, but above all in terms of security and identity issues, there was bound to be tremendous trouble. That was partly because the Russians wouldn't accept Ukraine with its present borders, Crimea, Sevastopol. Uh, making a clear choice for the West, NATO, you name it. But it was also that within Ukraine, you had deep divisions. One problem, you know, a new independent nation really needs a historical narrative, and not least a heroic narrative of opposition, resistance to the former imperial power. Ukraine didn't have one. You know, within living memory, millions of people had died violently on Ukrainian soil, often at the hands of other Ukrainians, fighting for two pretty repulsive tyrannies, Hitler and Stalin. You know, the symbols which were deeply emotional and fulfilling for many Ukrainians, the trident, the Ukrainian red and you know, blue and yellow flag, are anathema to much of the population, or were anyway, in eastern Ukraine and indeed in Crimea and elsewhere. So, you know, as I say, it doesn't altogether surprise me. I'm coming towards the end now, and I will just really make two more points. The first is that when one is talking about the collapse of land empires, the former metropolitan nation, probably still the most powerful polity in the region, really has two choices. Either it can seek to annex border provinces which it considers historically and ethnically to belong to it, which is roughly how the Russians regard certainly Crimea and the Donbass and indeed some other parts of Ukraine as well, as Putin's claim to four big regions plus Crimea shows. That's one option. Or you can leave those provinces in your neighbour and sort of use them as a Trojan horse to control it indirectly. The one thing which you almost never can do is both, for very obvious reasons. If you annex the border provinces which you consider your own, most in this case Russian, you automatically take out of the remaining Ukraine much of its pro-Russian community. On top of that, of course, you infuriate all other Ukrainians because they feel that, you know, their country's been broken up. Um, and broken up violently and by coercive and illegal means. At that point, don't expect to exercise much indirect influence over rump Ukraine. Now, you could argue that in the Cold War, the Soviet Union did get the best of both worlds in its relationship with Finland, so-called Finlandization. On the one hand, the Soviet Union did annex a key border province, Karelia, and yet, on the other hand, it did exert sufficient influence over Finland to ensure that Finland remained neutral, didn't allow itself uh, in any way to become part of the Western military or political alliance, and to some extent restrained itself in allowing its soil to be used for criticisms of Russia, of the Soviet Union, etc. The point is, though, that you know, to get to that stage, the Soviet Union needed to defeat the Finns in two very costly wars. It also offered them the example of East Central Europe. In other words, complete Soviet domination. 
At which point, the deal that the, the Finns got, you know, basic domestic, you know, internal autonomy, et cetera, et cetera, the survival of a liberal democratic political system, of a liberal capitalist system, et cetera, et cetera, was a pretty good deal. But the point is that the Soviet Union in 1945, you know, to 1985 was much more powerful than Putin's Russia. And that the Ukrainians, unlike the Finns, were not looking at subjugated neighbors of the Russian state, they were looking at the free states of East Central Europe and wanting to be like them. At which point, Russia's chances of simultaneously annexing border Ukrainian provinces and at the same time exercising a predominant influence over the remaining Ukrainian so-called independent state was zilch, frankly. And then, and most basically, it never occurred to any ruler of the Soviet Union, or indeed Russian, to question that the Finns were a separate people. Putin's claim, on which the invasion to Ukraine was based, is that Ukrainians have no separate national identity. And whatever may have been the case in 1850, that is nonsense in 2022. All right, so just the last point, the future. Look, the future in this case, as so often, is very hard to predict. Wars are, in the nature of things, unpredictable. Beyond that, an enormous amount is going to depend on what the Chinese do, whether, as is very possible, unfortunately, the Chinese-American relationship goes all the way down to, to war. And also, of course, whether the Trump is elected, whether the Americans withdraw support, what happens in the European Union, etc., etc. There are very, very many imponderables. Nevertheless, in, was it March or was it April 2022, I wrote that as far as I could see, the outcome of the war looked already pretty certain. Not completely, but pretty certain. It looked to me pretty clear that the Ukrainians had lost Crimea and they'd lost most of the Donbass. It also looked to me pretty clear that the Russians had lost Ukraine. What Putin has actually done is provided the Ukrainians with what they missed most. In other words, a unifying myth of national independence struggle against a common enemy. And the one thing which seems to me certain is that for any foreseeable future, there is going to be a powerful sense of united Ukrainian national identity rooted in hatred of Russia, unfortunately. That is deeply sad, given the fact that this is not part of Ukrainian or Russian historical heritage, but it seems now inevitable. As I say, it's not certain. You know, last year, there was always the chance that the Russian army would disintegrate, or indeed that the Russian elite would disintegrate. And of course, when we had Prigozhin's mutiny, um, and when we had the, you know, the collapse of the Russian army in the face of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in late 2022, it seemed possible. It hasn't happened, and I think that means it is probably unlikely to happen. So we have a different possible scenario this year. Look, in the last resort, there are four times more Russians than Ukrainians. Uh, Russia has many more resources. One effect of the war has been to push the price of Russian oil and gas through the roof, uh, partly because of the nature of the international com uh, capitalist economy, partly because of Chinese and Iranian help. Russia has evaded sanctions, etc., etc., etc. So maybe, just maybe, we're going to get the opposite scenario this year of the collapse of Ukraine as American assistance breaks down, as European assistance is reduced, as sheer exhaustion uh, bears down on the Ukrainian people. It is, after all, they who are suffering far more than your average Russian, certainly your average member of the Russian elite in Moscow or Petersburg. But actually, I think not. I think the likeliest scenario, as I've said already, is a frozen conflict likely to last for generations. I suspect, suspect, that even if Trump wins, and even if American assistance disappears, the Europeans will probably succeed in uniting and offering sufficient support for Ukraine to defend itself. No chance of recapturing Crimea, no chance of recapturing the Donbass. 
but probably enough, probably, not certainly, to defend itself as an independent sovereign state. And in time, probably, that would mean not a peace, but some kind of ceasefire roughly along the lines that we are at now. Now, that may be wishful thinking. It may be that what I want is feeding what I'm sort of semi-predicting. My basic feeling in this war is that would, it would be fatal if either side won completely. If Russia won completely, in other words, if Putin's initial plan succeeded, leaving outside the injustice to the Ukrainians, Russia would find itself trying to govern a large country in which it had minimal support, which had been devastated by war, quite apart from the material burdens that would place on the Russians, it would poison Russian politics, Russian culture, Russian life for a generation or more. On the other hand, if, as seemed conceivable last year, the Ukrainians won, recaptured Crimea, recaptured the Donbass, sure, in terms of international law, that might be just, but it would be extremely imprudent. Post-war Ukraine is going to have enough problems rebuilding itself without having to cope with millions of indignant Russians. On top of that, even if Russia had disintegrated, potentially, as with 1991, as with the Germans in 1918, Russia is the, latently the most powerful polity in the region. Most Russians do actually think that Crimea should be Russian. They care less about the Donbass and correctly. I mean, just as a sort of parenthesis, the idea that taking over Europe's biggest rust belt, now devastated by 10 years of war, is going to make Russia more powerful or richer is utter nonsense. As I said, my great-granddad and granddad owned the place, uh, you know, Donetsk. In those days, that made us the sort of equivalent of contemporary third-class oil shakes. If anyone offered it so-called back to me now, I'd change my name and emigrate to New Zealand. Um, you know, this is not a plus. So I think... You know, we do not want Russia to conquer Ukraine, but also we don't want a Weimar scenario in Russia where we wait another generation for Russia to regain its power and it strikes back then to, to get Crimea and everything. Conclusion. How important is this conflict? Look, I think to some extent the importance is exaggerated. Well, I've already said, I mean, the idea, to my mind, that Russia gains enormously by, re, you know by conquering the Donbass seems to be nonsense. Crimea is more of an asset to Russia, both culturally and geopolitically. It does mean Russian predominance in the Black Sea region. But you know, Europe has lived with Russian predominance in the Black Sea region for most of the last 230 years. It's not a matter of life and death. Um, in that sense, in that sense, I mean, I think the sort of Trumpian or sort of German social democrat scepticism, the belief that this is fundamentally a second order regional conflict has some justification. Clearly, this is a far less important conflict than the war between China and America over Taiwan, should it come, which will have truly devastating consequences for all of us. And yet, at the same time, this conflict in Ukraine is not insignificant. Partly, you know, if the West had stood aside, if, which was impossible, they had basically agreed a second Yalta. In other words, they had said, sure, the Baltic Republics, Poland, you know, the Balkans, that's our sphere, Ukraine is yours. They couldn't have done it, but, you know, if they had, well, that wouldn't have been the end of the world in terms of geopolitics, whatever else it might have been in terms of justice. But once the West has nailed its flag to supporting Ukraine, if it then pulls out and is defeated, that is a very major defeat for the West and a very major sign of weakness at precisely the time when Putin certainly, and Xi Jinping probably as well, deep in their hearts, think that the West is weakening and in their hearts believe that democracy is a hopeless system of government. The, the ideological 
basis for the Russian-Chinese alliance is a very simple one. It is the old conservative belief that the mass of the population is too stupid, too ignorant, too selfish, or just basically too desperate to stay afloat to actually be entrusted with sovereignty and above all entrusted with sovereignty when it comes to the big issues of geopolitics, defense and diplomacy. And certainly, if Trump stops all American assistance, if the EU doesn't fill the gap in any way, if Russia wins, then it will certainly, I think, be interpreted in Moscow and in Beijing as a sign that history is unequivocally on their side uh, and another push you know, will, will yield rewards. And in that sense, this conflict really does matter well beyond uh, Eastern Europe. And at that point, I shall stop. Thank you very much for listening to me. I do recall that at the time the Soviet Union disintegrated, there was a widespread apprehension for a time of a major arms clash between Russia and Ukraine, probably triggered by Crimea, which Khrushchev gave to Ukraine in 1954, <clears throat> but uh, Crimea resonates with Russians in ways that uh, Professor Levin mentioned, uh, or, and or, you know, uh, not, uh, not or, but secondarily also by, by the Donbass, uh, which uh, uh, the Putin Kremlin calls Novo Russia, I think, or New, New Russia. And in the end, that anticipated war between Russia and Ukraine did not materialize. Instead, Yugoslavia blew up catastrophically uh, in the Balkans, and that mayhem continued for a good decade. Uh, in part, probably, perhaps, I'm no expert on Russia or Ukraine or the former Soviet Union, in part, perhaps, there was no conflict because very soon after the Soviet Union's collapse, Russia descended into a state of chaos under Yeltsin, and Putin had to rebuild the Russian state. But the reckoning was delayed, and that was one of the points, the delayed effect. Um, and the reckoning was delayed, um, and that was one of the many points that uh, Professor Levin was making. Um, I can't uh, resist uh, sharing with you how a Russian official uh, tried to justify the invasion of the Ukraine um, two years ago, uh, shortly after it started. So um, uh, he asked an Indian interviewer, um, wouldn't you like a friendly government, preferably a client in Islamabad? This is Pakistan Islamabad, okay? And the Indian interviewer's face lit up and said, of course, I mean, that would be a dream come true. A friendly government, preferably a client in Islamabad. And the Russian official said, well, Ukraine is our Pakistan. And we are simply trying to install a friendly government, preferably a client in Kiev, right? So what's wrong with that? Okay, you have no idea what an interesting background Professor Levin has. I just told you uh, one tidbit that he was born in Singapore a decade after the Indian National Army was formed there, but I'll share very quickly a few other tidbits with you, which I don't think he will particularly mind. Um, almost exactly 200 years ago, in the early 19th century, his ancestor, also with the surname Levin, practically ran the Russian Empire, correct? Uh, well, slight exaggeration, but not, not much. He's already told you about how his family owned, I think, half of the Donbass. Um, well, there's 
something India related as well, which I'm sure will intrigue you. You remember the famous incident from 1908 uh, in which uh, Khudiram Bose and Prafullo Chaki mistakenly killed two women because they targeted the wrong horse carriage. They were after a judge called Kingsford, I believe, and two women were killed uh, because of their inadvertent uh, error. Uh, well, those two women were both relatives of Professor Levens. And in our history books, we have read that uh, uh, that the two white women were killed, or two British women, but one of them was in fact Indian. Finally, Professor Levin's wife is Japanese, and she has the same surname Fujiwara as Fujiwara Iwaichi, the legendary Japanese officer who was instrumental in launching the INA in Singapore in 1942, and who later in life became a dear friend of Shishir and Krishna Bose and the Nitaji Research Bureau. Um, I should say that it's rare to hear a lecture of this richness, of this caliber, of this texture, of this clarity, quality, sophistication anywhere in the world, even in a top university in the Western world, and least of all in the intellectual wasteland that is Calcutta. Um, so this is truly an exceptional event. Um, Professor Leifen has, I think, done justice to a very challenging brief. Um, a grand sweep packed with insight and intelligible to us all. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I call him by his nickname, uh, Chai. You know, Chai, that um, my mother was a rather intellectually curious creature. And she often, she wanted to know about things. She wanted to understand better um, events, places that she didn't fully understand. And she would often ask me to explain such places, events, um, to her, and I had no patience, um, or very little patience, to do so, and I would usually ignore her. Um, so, I think she is very happy today that Professor Levin, her friend, has explained the Russia-Ukraine conflict to her in such a clear but deep appraisal, which is so enlightening, so enlightening, and goes so far beyond the instant analysis that always proliferates whenever a major armed conflict breaks out. And I think the central thread of this multi-textured lecture is the long and usually dark shadow of empire and especially, but especially, the end of empire. And that, of course, is a theme that resonates in India because of our own historical experience and our own contemporary predicament. Uh, I think I will uh, pass it on to uh, Professor Shugoto Bose uh, for a comment. Um, and uh, we might take a couple of questions, uh, although we are over time, but would you like to uh, make, a, make a comment? As a, as a fellow historian, I'm, I'm a political scientist, not a historian. Well, I think uh, you have uh, uh, said uh, what needed to be said about the quality and sophistication of Professor Dominic Levin's fourth uh, Krishna Bose uh, lecture. Um, if I were to ask him a question rather than make a comment, uh, I would like to, you know, take him back to his favorite date, 1850. You know, what he gave us in the lecture 
were certain snapshots of, you know, what Ukrainian identity may have been like in 1850 and how it had changed by 1914. Would it be fair to say that uh, we probably should look at this as a process leading from 1850 to 1914? You know, one of my wonderful colleagues, whom you know well uh, uh, too, Charlie Meyer, uh, talked about 1850 or 1860 perhaps as the beginning of an age of territoriality which lasted for about a century. And would it be fair to say that the Russian Empire, along with other empires which also lasted into the early 20th century, let us say the Ottoman Empire, had a better approach to somehow including, without alienating, uh, various regions and provinces, and also had a very different conception of borders. You know, empires were typically happy with uh, fuzzy boundaries, and therefore there were fewer territorial disputes. But could it be that even in the case of the Russian Empire, there was a move towards the empire becoming a, more like a l large, sprawling nation state. Just as in the Ottoman Empire, with the Tanzimat reforms in the 1830s and onwards, there was a kind of creeping centralization, in some ways giving up on the better imperial ideas of negotiating differences. Yeah, yes, thank you. That's a very interesting uh, set of questions. And of course, I could keep you here till midnight. I think the basic dilemma, uh, which faces European, but also by then Japanese, and to the extent they understand these things, American statesmen, uh, in the, already by the last decades of the 19th century, is a simple one. To really count as a great power it looks pretty clear that you're going to have to have vast scale, which probably means continental scale resources. That, of course, means economic resources, raw materials. It means population. Quite apart from anything else, it is absolutely clear to any intelligent European statesman or public intellectual that no European nation state is going to be able to compete with the United States in terms of power unless you acquire resources on a continental scale. The only way you can do that is through empire. And that is the geopolitical foundation for the age of high imperialism. It's not the only one. Uh, it's also that, you know, once all the European and indeed the Japanese and the Americans are involved in, in, the, in the scramble for territory, there's a strong incentive to get your flag down first before someone else gets there. Um, not least because technology is changing so quickly that areas of the world which previously seem useless suddenly now look as if they may be really valuable. That, after all, is the basis for, of the idea of the first and greatest British geopolitician, think of Holford Mackinder, who argued that the age of sea power and seaborne empires was giving way to the age of great land empires Above all, because technology, which meant communications, railways, telegraphs, but also deep mining technology, for instance, meant that nowadays you could actually colonize and exploit the heartlands of continents. So there is a whole gamut of reasons why empire seems to be the name of the game in terms of international power. And yet at the same time, and in a very contradictory way, the key to domestic legitimacy, consolidating communities, legitimizing elites and governments in an era when you're competing with socialist and, and other you know, doctrines, is the nation, is nationalism. So somehow you've got to combine the scale and power of empire with the solidarity and legitimacy of the nation. 
And actually, most of the great empires, in one sense or another, try to do this. Um, interestingly, the empire which is usually written off as most hopeless, the Ottoman one, is in a sense the one which, through Islam, has the most effective supranational ideology around which it might coalesce. You know. um, what you get in Russia is what you get more often in these imperial leaderships. It is the attempt to consolidate as much as possible of the empire into what you might describe as a nation. And that, after all, is at the core of Russian government fears and policies vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. We've got to stop these people becoming a separate nation, thinking as if they were a separate nation. We've got to make sure that in political terms, they think of themselves as Russians, even if they have all sorts of charming local you know, cult, uh, customs. And actually, you know, the country on earth which is, has the oldest tradition of empire and which is, to my mind anyway, impregnated with the idea of empire, for better as well as worse, in its identity as China. And it is the only one of the great old empires which has actually about three quarters of the way turned itself into a nation state. Not, of course, without revolution, certainly not through democracy, um, and not entirely, as we can see only too well in Xinjiang, etc. But nevertheless, the fact that the Chinese have done, which so many rulers of empire, including the Russian, dreamt of doing, turning most of their empire into a sort of Chinese nation state, is, I think, fundamental to the fact that China <coughs> is a potential superpower. Indeed, it probably is already a superpower. So it's all, you know, these are complicated issues. And I mean, the game isn't over. <coughs> you know, the great <coughs> powers of today and even more tomorrow are not going to be city-states and they're not going to be the kind of middle-ranking uh, kingdoms, proto-nation states that Montesquieu talked about. They're going to be sort of neo-empires in scale, which nevertheless are to a significant degree legitimized by the national <coughs> principle. And they're also, you know, the, the only countries in the world which really matter, are almost by definition ungovernable. Empires were always devils to govern because of their scale and their diversity. But imperial government in pre-modern times was very, very limited. Trying to run a modern China or unite, read Barack Obama's, you know, um, memoir, or <coughs> India, uh, you know, or, or Europe, whatever that means. Um, trying to, you know, govern these vast, complex polities uh, is a nightmare. So the only cu countries, the only states which really matter in the world are almost by definition ungovernable, even without the Trumps coming along. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are at quarter to eight, so we will wrap up. Um, if people uh, who wanted to ask questions want to come and ask me separately, then of course. Yes, why don't we quickly, o yes. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. We'll finish by eight completely, yeah. Okay. I think uh, yeah. Please be brief and to the point. Yeah. Well, thanks, Professor Levin, for a wonderful and illuminating and enlightening presentation. I have a couple of questions. My first question is what I read from the media regarding the Russian-Ukraine conflict was when Mikhail Gorbachev, the East Germany, was agreed to, make, to be part of the Germ German Germany only on condition that NATO wouldn't expand towards Eastern Europe and towards the Baltic states. But though it was verbal, nothing was written down. L let me answer that question first before I forget. You know, until December 91, when I went to live in Japan, I was on Margaret Thatcher's Foreign Policy Advisory Committee. Um, maybe the people in Washington were thinking differently, but we did have pretty good exchange of information. Nobody in the West and Western governments at that time was thinking of expanding NATO into Eastern Europe. The whole issue was whether Germany was going to be allowed to stay within NATO. This was off our map. We just didn't think about such things. Um, I think the evidence suggests that nothing formally was written down but that assurances were given to the Russians. And if you're talking about 1991 to two, this was just not on the agenda. 
Um, so that would be my answer to that question. And the, as I said, I, th I hope in my lecture, the Russians have some right to a grievance for that reason. Although, as I also tried to say, if you're a small country in Eastern Europe, um, you have damn good reasons to fear the future and want NATO protection. Y your second question. Yeah, my second question is, in the United States, you know, one of the Republican Party nominees, Vivek Ramaswamy, has said that there are no angels in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. He said that Floyd, that um, President Biden took a $5 million bribe through his son, Hunter Biden, to help the Ukrainians. So I met the, Joe Biden has a personal interest in helping the Zelensky. It's nothing to do with that, believe me. God only knows what did or did happen to Hunter Biden. But that is not what is important in Washington. Um, what is important is that we've returned to American isolationism, uh, p potentially. And that has extremely interesting prospects uh, for the world. Uh, next question, who was next? Just one more. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the last question. Um, so, I, I, I'll just, you know, um, uh, narrate an incident which is kind of tangential. I, so I really wouldn't, to be honest. No, just 30 yeah. seconds, which yeah. is, is a little obscure. Yeah. So, I run a critical uh, listening session for Western music. And sometime after 2010, I was doing a um, session on Janacek. Um, and his famous piece, Tarash Pulba. Yeah. And this, this lady, um, a white lady who used to stay and attend some of my programs, suddenly got up, became very excited and said, this is a Ukrainian folklore. And my own understanding was it was mostly Russian and then based on Gogol. So was there a separate identity already through folklore of Ukraine versus Russia? Sorry, it was a good question. Um, yes and no is the inadequate answer. Gogol thought of himself as Russian. Uh, but of course, Shevchenko thought of himself as Ukrainian. They lived at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will, at that time, have some Ukrainians who, for instance, regard the Cossack tradition as being part of a universal Russian, including Ukrainian, uh, historical tradition. And you will have others who say that the Cossacks, as the embodiment of freedom, freedom is specifically Ukrainian, whereas the Cossack, as the knout and the tender of the Russian state, an oppressor of the people, is Russian. Uh, that's what the argument was all about, really. You know. I think about the best book I've read, 19th century history, um, was a book by a man called Weber, Peasants into Frenchmen. Turning peasants into citizens of a modern nation is a process, and not a natural one. Um, you know, intelligentsia's governments inculcate this to a great extent. And again, that happens from 1870 to 1900. Absolutely, this is the time it happens. It's when you create state educational systems, you have, you know, et cetera. Um, the process is simple enough when there's no doubt that you've got one intelligentsia which itself knows what nation it belongs, et cetera, et cetera. They control the state, they control the narrative, they inculcate this into peasants who probably at some level have some willingness to accept because, you know, peasants also have read fairy stories about St. Louis and this and that. The complication comes when you have rival intelligentsias trying to inculcate their sense of identity into a peasantry. The Balkans is a classic for this one. You know, Bulgarians, Serbs, Greeks, you name it. Not for nothing was Macedonia called Macedonia, Macedoan, fruit salad. Ukraine is more important, but it is the same basic issue, you know. Right, the very last question. Yeah. I would li like to ask you uh, one more question, if you please allow me. Yeah. Yeah. I spent my childhood, uh, though from afar, in the shadow of uh, communism. You, you know, the uh, uh, communist government ruled here almost 35 yeah. years. I thought uh, uh, Nikolai Gogol was a Russian writer. Uh, <laughs> lately, I know he was Ukrainian, you know. My question is, how did Russian language play a role to suppress Ukrainians' identity or Ukrainian language. Look, 
the first thing to say is that if you're talking about the pre-modern world, 95% of the population are peasants, liter they're not literate, um, they speak a local dialect. Most of the peasantry along what is now the Russian-Ukrainian borderlands, millions and millions of people, in those days spoke a dialect which was incomprehensible to citizens of either Kiev or Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, when you're talking about the intelligentsia, the fact that Gorgol is, uh, you know, of Ukrainian ethnicity, but thinks of himself as a Russian and writes in Russian, tells you about some of the complexities of empire and nation. Above all, actually, when you're talking about the great land empires, you know. Um, but if you're asking how the Russian state did its best to stop, uh, you know, a sense of Ukrainian identity emerging, one of the key things it did was to put very harsh constraints on the use of Ukrainian, um, no education in Ukrainian in any school, public or private, no publications in the Ukrainian language um, from the 1870s on, far fiercer than Russian imperial policy vis-a-vis, -vis, let us say, the use of Lithuanian or Latvian or German uh, or any other. And that is because the rulers of imperial Russia, firstly, know very well that Poles and Germans and Latvians are not Russian. Secondly, they, they don't know that Ukrainians aren't Russians and they're determined not to let them become not Russians. And that is above all because of the geopolitical importance of Ukraine. As the Russian Minister of the Interior wrote in the 1870s, given especially the unification of Germany and the geopolitical threat posed by the wider Germanic world, this is the German-Austrian alliance on our western frontier, can we really afford to allow any kind of risk of secession of Ukrainians who are, after all, not merely a vast percentage of the population, but are sitting on some of the economically most important and strategically most important provinces of the empire? And that is the logic behind Tsarist repression. And to an extent it works. You know, it is vitally important when the Russian state collapses in 1917 and does not really recover its power until 1920-21, that a sense of Ukrainian identity is so weak among the peasantry. Had it not been, uh, the Soviet Union might have found it very difficult to reassert its control over Ukraine. And without that, the Soviet Union would have been a much weaker country. And if Ukraine had survived and survived as a German satellite, then Germany would have been the dominant power in Central and Eastern Europe, for better or worse, for better or worse, you know. <coughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot. To, um, to use a hackneyed term I don't particularly like, Chai, that was truly magisterial. Uh, an outstanding Krishna Bose lecture and a wonderful finale to our program on Netaji's 127th birthday. I want to thank all of you for coming. There is one last night's ritual, and that is uh, the presentation of uh, a couple of books to Professor Levin. Um, that to uh, me, um, So one of them is Netaji, A Life in Pictures, which has photographs and documents sourced from Netaji Research Bureau's archives, published in 2022. The other is Krishna Bose's compilation of uh, her writings, some of her best and most notable writings on Netaji, his life, his politics, and his struggle for India's freedom. Chai, you already have the hardback of this book because I gave it to you, but I suspect it's in your London house somewhere, and since you're traveling back to Japan, you can take the paperback, which has come out this year, 
the hardback came out in 2022. The paperback came out in 2023 uh, with you to, uh, to Japan. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure you know, having you here. And uh, good evening. And once again, Jai Hind. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.